Hey everyone, it's Jonathan, and welcome back to Every Version Ever. Today I'm joined by Nikki from Trivial Theater and Dan from TYTD Reviews to talk about an early 2000s era made-for-TV movie starring Kaylee Cuoco, Kevin Zegers, and Nick Carter from the Backstreet Boys. This is a modern adaptation slash sequel to The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. It has characters that correspond to each of the Sleepy Hollow characters, but also the Washington Irving story is canonically real history in this movie. It's kind of bizarre, kind of terrible, kind of boring, but also kind of hilariously dumb. This is actually the perfect kind of movie to do for a podcast because it's so much more fun to talk about than it was to watch, and there was no one more perfect to discuss this film with than Nikki and Dan. I take it neither of you guys had seen this. Uh, no. I don't even remember hearing about it. Well, I'd never heard of it, but it, like, I'm not into horror very much, so I just discovered it because I was looking for versions of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow for this yeah. series. See, I wouldn't even necessarily, you know, there, there's that, there's Halloween movies and then there's horror movies. This is a mm. Halloween movie, like again, mm-hmm. and I, I said it before we got rolling and no, no, no shade on it. It's, it's not, it's not a terrible movie, but it reminds me more of something like, like a Disney channel or like a lifetime movie. It's kind of like a PG 13 Disney or a lifetime movie or something, something in that vein. There's a little bit of blood, but not a lot. You know, there's like that edge of nudity, but not really. You know, it's kind of in that in that realm. Mm. There, you know, the Halloween or the the Sleepy Hollow stuff is kind of adjacent to the the drama of high school. You know, kid with his dad and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah I had read that this was rated R, so I was expecting something Seriously? a lot worse than what what this what? was. What? It was much <laughs> tamer than I expected. How? And I. I <laughs> I mean, no disrespect, but how? <laughs> I they, don't know. Uh, they showed one kill on screen. I actually kept track of it. They they had one. All the other kills they cut away, and then they cut back, and the person's on the floor. They showed one actual kill in the entire movie. The thing that annoyed me as well, and I looked at this up, the film was an hour and 22 minutes long. Five minutes of that hour and 22 is end credits, and three and a half minutes <laughs> is opening titles. So like you're already down to an hour and sixteen, hour and seventeen before before, before the film's even started. Okay, so I'm just looking up like the certification thing as to why it was listed as an R-rated movie. One instance of sex and nudity. Um, girl wearing a nurse costume starts to unbutton and get, disengage her. And I mean, you can kind of they kind of imply certain acts, but they really don't go into it. Um, they don't even really show any nudity either, though. That's the thing. Yeah. It's like she unbuttons her blouse. You see a, a little bit of, of chest, but no cleavage or anything like that. And, and that's, right. that's it. That's the whole... I mean, you do see the, the guy's head. I mean... And that was the, probably like the most disturbing thing in the whole thing, but it looked so fake mm. that it was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so I'm looking here. Uh, gore and violence, the guy is killed off screen, but you hear the sound of a sword and see his body being dragged. Um, the sheriff is killed by the horseman. Um, guy is beheaded while he kisses a girl. Um, shot of her dead body. Profanity is mild. Uh, drug and alcohol is mild. Frightening scenes moderate. This is this is a PG thirteen. I don't know how this got an R rating. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, it was TV. That that might be the thing. So it's more like that. That's probably why it's quote rated R. Mm. I would I would bet because uh, it looks like. It was rated R, but it was also rated TV-14, was the original TV rating. Mm, so TV-14 makes more sense. Oh, 100%. Yeah. My assumption is that it's probably... I'm not sure where they got the R from there, but yeah. Oh, I'm not actually sure. I just... I, like, I was reading oh, no, no. around, and like I never saw like an actual page that said this was rated R. I just saw people talking about it rated R, so... Maybe it was. I don't no, know. No, it was. They had that on the DVD. I don't know. No, the MPAA rated this R for scary in- images and sexuality. Oh, okay, but so it was. Hmm. Like there are certain traditionally there are certain things that will rate something as R, and I'm not. I would not in any universe consider this an R-rated movie. I don't know. Maybe it's more than yeah. It doesn't matter, but when you consider the films like Halloween, Deadpool, the Friday the Thirteenth movies, they are all R-rated, and they go a lot harder than this film. Did. Mm-hmm. This film was like the shallow end of that, if yeah. if at all that. Um, I don't know, it, it just blew my mind that it's like, I think Triv actually put it best. This is really more of a Halloween movie than a horror movie. It's it's a film that's 
of the season, but yeah. it's not really pushing the envelope of the kind of traditional horror elements. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, on the whole, I just kind of I, I got through it, and I just sat there and thought, well, you know, it 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 hits every single trope of a low budget, trying to be a little spooky but not quite managing it type film it it had moments where it just dragged and dragged and dragged in terms of of plot line because it's trying to pad the runtime out to a feature length so it could get like a television airing because coming in at about an hour and 20 you can probably put two maybe three ad breaks in on that and it'll take you to the hour and a half mark um it's just a it's a quite it's quite a dry film and they don't really fully engage the horror element of it until the last kind of 20 minutes before that, it's it's basically almost like a, a high school special. For most of this movie, I felt like I was watching a bad WB show from when I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the, you look at the the subject matter of it. You know, guy moves to a new town. He, you know, entrances the high school. You know, the the football, the head football player's like girl. She's got, you know, she's kind of independent and all that good stuff. And he's a kind of a jerk and all that and all that stuff. Kind of, he's got his dad doesn't understand him. His mom is sympathetic. You know, the, it's kind of a WB standby in the grand scheme, or CW, or however you want to play it. It was all just so shallow. That was the the big thing that kind of, of hit me. Every single character was was just the stereotype of that type of character, and, yeah. and nothing else. There was no depth. Yet the mm-hmm. grave digger was basically just playing Crazy Ralph from Friday the Thirteenth. I mean, all the time he was talking, I just kept in my head hearing, "It's got a death curse." Um, <laughs> Just the cheerleader is is a typical cheerleader and nothing else. The the main character is just that kind of, you know, can't do wrong kind of, you know, goes on a bit of a journey type thing. But no, there's no depth. Every every single character is just he's this and that's it. It it just really left me wanting just a little bit more complexity, even if it was just like characters having ulterior motives to their their standard kind of character archetype. It would have been nice to see it do a little bit of a zag where I was expecting it to do a zig, but it was all zig all the time. I mean, with Brody, the kind of bully slash football player, he he kind of turned things around and became a not terrible person. Mm. A little bit, but he moaned all the way. Kind of only because he he? was threatened with being branded a coward in legend. I mean, I'm not going to disagree, but, you know, he still did (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's the thing though it would have been nice to have, to have the the script at least acknowledge that he did it of his own accord rather than being yeah. humiliated into it you know what i mean <laughs> that's true that's true i'm not gonna say it was a good motive i'm just saying that he wasn't maimed horribly by the you know horsemen and i don't know because <laughs> yeah. he did have some redeeming value a bet that was because he was essentially you know called out so yeah. I was expecting him to die by the end, so I was surprised he made it. Yeah, that that surprised me too. Like no one normally, there's at least one like norm. One of the bigger characters will have ending up had end have ended up biting it, and none of them did. So it gave me real hocus pocus vibes, but like not not good hocus pocus. <laughs> hocus pocus too. <laughs> well, maybe. Well, yeah, I haven't seen that one yet, but maybe. <laughs> I, I mean, I like Post- Hocus Pocus two better than the first one. So. Oh, John. but I'm not. I was not. I didn't grow up with the first one, so John. I have no nostalgia. John, <laughs> eh, it wasn't terrible. I could have done without the twenty minute segment inside of Walgreens, but that's me. <laughs> I, I thought it was funny, but in a like a bad kind of funny that turned around like so bad it became funny again. <laughs> I did enjoy the, and I think we talked about this last year. I did enjoy the Roomba as a, as a broom. That was pretty good. And the, and the Swiffer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, Dan, we are completely spoiling this for you. Those, those are uh, those are some of the more notable parts of that movie. But. No, it wasn't right. badly done. Get... I'll uh, I'll have a couple of beers and forget it ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> But the the thing that got I mean it's just it, it's the genericism genericism is that a word is how generic this thing really mm-hmm. was I mean like just looking I mean I I am a purveyor of early two thousands horror I and en- I enjoy it quite quite a bit but it's just it hit every single trope everything was was like slightly desaturated with a bit of an orange tinge to it everything was really shot really darkly 
so you could barely see what was happening for most of the film's runtime. Um, they had the obligatory early 2000s grungy sort of rock soundtrack. <laughs> that was one of the things that stood out to me the most. <laughs> yeah. That just didn't fit the film at all, but was for somehow just crammed in there. Um you know, the, all the characters were dressed painfully early 2000s. Like, there wasn't any subtlety I mean, it was it the all. early 2000s. Well, yeah, but there's there's dressing in the... Two, I mean, like, there's dressing in the 2000s like, I don't know, um, Final Destination or um, the remake of 13 Ghosts. And then there's dressing in the 2000s like you've just stepped out of high school musical. Um, I mean, this like was the, 2004. The way they were dressing was probably what you would find at your average wherever you shop for clothes in 2004 you know it's not exactly mm. hot topic i don't know i just I, it just felt too intense it was like every single possible fashion disaster of the <laughs> 2000s congregated with these characters again this is when this was in fashion you know <laughs> i mean they're not going to be dressing in baby doll dresses and stuff like that cuz that would like end and um <laughs> Like plaid, cause and giant legged jeans, cause that was like that was like mid nineties, that kind of stuff. I, that I would have been painful. Solid, I think it's just a solid argument that everybody should always wear morph suits in these films, <laughs> so that they can just green screen on the latest clothes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found an explanation for at least one part of this. Uh, the movie premiered on ABC Family, but had to be heavily ah. edited before the broadcast in order to make it suitable for a TV audience version can be seen on dvd so john the version that you showed us that was two minutes longer that was probably the non-edited version so i thought of that after i found the thing about things that they had cut out i was like oh that's why there was two versions makes sense i mean guys i i, I don't want to challenge the pedigree of the writing of this thing but the person who wrote it did deep blue c2 and the goldbergs so i mean the goldbergs isn't that bad well, but... you did two episodes of the Gold Oh, too. okay. Yeah. <laughs> were they dressed painfully 80s for your taste? They were. Too much. Just green screen them, mocap it. Do what they did with Planet of the Apes. That was fantastic. Just have more just have more be apes. That would be fun. We'll have the hollow, but it's an all monkey version. <laughs> that actually would be a much better movie. <laughs> That's a lie, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Ichabod chimp, sorted. We'll call it Ichabod chimp. <laughs> now I want this. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but um, the only thing I really genuinely enjoyed in this film, being honest from top to bottom, was the Gravedigger character. He seemed to kind of get the tone that this film sort of needed. He, he, was, he reminded me of Quint from Jaws. Um, with a little bit of Crazy Ralph from Friday the 13th thrown in. But he also clearly knew that the script for this was a little bit dry, so he, he does put a little bit of humour in his line delivery in places. And whenever he was on screen, I, I kind of perked up a little bit. But outside of his involvement, it was the, the bit that got me that made me laugh was um, there's a bit in the film where he gives the lead character a book about the history of the Headless Horseman. And he says, you need to read this cover to cover. Everything in this book will be invaluable to you. And then later in the film, um, he just randomly runs in and goes, we've got to get, we've got to cut the, the roots down in the graveyard. He's he's seeping power from the roots. And the main character turns and says, there's nothing about roots in the book. And he goes, I didn't write everything in the book. And it's like, <laughs> what was the point in telling to read it if it's not, if it's not <laughs> informative? There was so much in this movie that just did not make sense because you had the whole thing like this in this the universe of this movie. This is the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow was real history, apparently. And the main character is descended from Ichabod Crane and his main argument of why I can't be descended from him. So I have a different last name. And then he gives him this whole convoluted explanation of like how his name was changed by different people over the years. And then by the end of the movie, he says that they, they have to change it. The, if they have kids, they have to change the last name so that he doesn't have to go through this again. I was just like, you just, you at the beginning of the movie, you gave this whole convoluted explanation of why, even though he has a different last name, he's still a crane. <laughs> and now you're saying that his kids have to change their last name. So they're not cranes anymore. <laughs> what? The, the best part of that scene and the thing that made me laugh as well I, I i picked up on that as well and the thing that got me though was him saying um you better change his name i don't want to have to do this again and i was like mate you're a 50 to 60 year old alcoholic grave digger you're not making it to the next kid <laughs> I'm amazed you made it to the end of the movie, quite frankly. 
Oh, the fact too. that he goes everywhere he goes as well. Everybody just assumes he's an alcoholic. He's never drunk in his life. <laughs> he's got to live up to the stereotype. Gosh darn it. I feel like the first half of the movie and the second half of the movie were very dumb for completely different reasons. <laughs> the first was just so stereotypically high school drama dumb. And the second mm. was just like, they just started writing things that didn't make sense with the first half of the movie. And we're like, whatever, <laughs> nobody's going to care. <laughs> yeah, Final destination. This wasn't. No. I um when I was I chatted to Triv briefly before we jumped on to the cast and I, I basically said to her it's the kind of movie that you would put on in the background on Halloween whilst you were doing something else like it's the sort of film you'd be like prepping the the candy bowl with or you'd be in and out dealing with trick or treaters and you just go I'll just chuck this film on it's it's got atmosphere and you kind of you dip in and out in five minute bursts and you know you kind of get a bit of a vibe off it but it's it's not something that I think I would ever consciously choose to sit down and watch from beginning to end and go, oh, this is great. I love this film. It's it's amazing. <laughs> it had its moments in the third act, but and and I don't want to go too heavy into spoilers, but the ending as well was was very um very predictable, but also very brief. It's basically it, like it halfway so through quick. the film. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Half halfway through the film they go, Oh, if you do this, he'll die. And then at the end of the film. They did it, and he's gone in like two seconds. It's like, okay, well, that was. Yeah, I think that he doused an himself and I think he doused himself in gasoline or something. It's uh, pure Mountain Dew. Yeah, oh, that's also good. <laughs> <laughs> nice like even the, burn. The mythology of this movie hardly makes sense at all. It's <laughs> like just going by the book. If the book is real, Ichabod Crane, depending on how you want to look at it, because in the book, it is heavily implied that the Headless Horseman is not real, and he was created by Brom Bones to scare Ichabod Crane out of town so that he would stop hitting on Katrina so that Brom could get Katrina for himself. And if that's the interpretation, then Ichabod is still alive, and then he could go on and have descendants that Ian could be a, one of these descendants. But if you go with the interpretation that the Headless Horseman was real, then he killed Ichabod. So he couldn't have descendants. And then the whole thing about the thing with the bridge at the end, because like if you assume that he's real, then why does the bridge stop him? Like, yes, it supposedly stops him in the book, but if the legend was made up by Brom to scare Ichabod. <laughs> well, I'm not going to try and play into this because in the grand scheme, we were putting more thought into this than they uh, did, yeah. which isn't an uncommon thing. <laughs> But you could claim that, you know how, like, with Freddy Krueger, stuff kind of manifested because people believed it? I would almost say that, like, because people believed this legend so strongly that it kind of manifested this into life or manifested more of it into life. I suppose that's as good an explanation as that's any all I got. from the movie itself. <laughs> I'll take it. I'm also going to mention here because I, I, it, it's just popped up on my notes. Um, one of my favorite line deliveries in the entire film is um, near the end where they go on the second hayride and they load the old lady onto the hayride and she goes, this hay stinks. And the guy goes, oh, yeah, well, don't worry, we'll change it after this. And you get, she goes, yeah, yeah, change it. And then it just cuts away <laughs> and nothing else is done about it. <laughs> Yeah, that kind of that kind of got me. They're like, "Oh, well, we've got a big important person on this thing. We you need to do really well." And it's like, it didn't matter really one way or the other. It was literally just I was expecting it was a something burger. to come from that woman because they made it seem like she was so important, mm. and then nothing came of it. The best part about her was she went, "How distasteful!" When someone got dead. <laughs> <laughs> That was like the only time I really laughed in the whole movie. <laughs> Not that it was supposed to be like the movie wasn't supposed to be funny, but like that was that was the best part. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it was. Yeah. <laughs> Were you guys familiar with any of the cast? Um. So Ky Kylie. Kaylee Cuoco. Yeah, I mean she's she's in um uh, Harley Quinn. She was the love. She was Penny in Big Bang. She's mm -hmm. been in a lot of other stuff. Um, Nick, or, uh, Nick Carter, he his brother was, I think, one of the Backstreet Boys. Or Nick was Carter was in the Backstreet Boys. Okay, it, it was Aaron his brother Carter was, was his brother, who was a 
singer by himself i believe got it okay yeah so which I, like i'm not familiar with the backstreet boys so i i like i had read that there was one of the backstreet boys in here so i was like looking up like i was watching i was like okay which one is the the backstreet boys so i had to like look <laughs> up and try and figure out like cross-reference pictures like oh yeah it's the one brody the brody is the backstreet boy <laughs> <laughs> honestly i didn't and i guess it had been quite a while because I kind of grew up on the Backstreet Boys. I like I, I I haven't paid a lot of attention to where he went and whatnot, but I I definitely didn't recognize him as um like that Backstreet Boy or as a Backstreet Boy. Mm-hmm. The main guy though, Ian, kind of reminded me of um Zac Efron. Like I feel like he was specifically cast because he kind of looks like Zac Efron. Well, Zac Efron probably wouldn't have even been a thing back then. Like he would have been alive, but I don't think he would have been a name, would he? Well, because he when became did... yeah, the High School Musical come out. Yeah, well, yeah the, that would have been the after question. this because the High School Musical was. I think I was in my twenties because I still haven't ever. Well, I might have seen um, it, but if I've seen it, I don't remember it. Right. I, th- yeah, I don't 2006. think. Two thousand and six. Okay, it's two years later. I mean, but the main guy, Kevin Z- Zegers, Z- Z- Zegers. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. I actually do kind of know him he was the star of the air bud movies and oh, i loved okay. those as a kid but he was a kid back then so he's not exactly recognizable and it's been so many years since i've seen any of the air bud movies that i wouldn't have recognized him yeah i was gonna say too the um judge reinhold was a big guy back in the, the 80s like he was a, a you know heartthrob kind of like um like charlie sheen or um tom cruise or any of those guys like he was kind of in that group of guys Kind of Brat Pack esque. Mm. Oh, in yeah. one of the worst films I've ever seen, uh, "Let's Ruin Dad's Day." Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, it was. It's a bad movie. It's, it's one of the only films that I I like. I give it a really bad review. I say it's one of the worst films I've ever seen because it's one of the only films I've seen that currently, if you showed it to your kids, would probably leave them with messages that could actually put them in harm's way. the The plot of that film is that a kid is worried that his parents are getting divorced, so he goes over to try and he goes over to the city with his dad who's played by Judge Reinhold to try and um ruin his day so that they can reconcile um but the subplot of it is about a young girl who's like an, who's like 12 years old who meets somebody online anonymously and they want to link up and like go and hang out and like all the way through the film like the parents are just like, oh yeah, no, it's fine. You can go and meet this stranger online. It's all good. Everything's great. And then she meets him, and it turns out that it's like a seven-year-old boy. And it's oh, just like that, that was in the yeah. opposite direction. I thought it was going. <laughs> yeah. And like the whole the whole film is like proper enablement for stranger danger. Like the entire film's kind of motto is, hey, you know what? Parents aren't always right. Sometimes you can go and meet strangers from the internet, and it'll just work out. Oof. Um. But Reinhold's fine enough here. Um, yeah. I, I liked his little monologue where he was talking to his wife about how she, how he used to take her to horror movies just because he thought it put women in the mood. I thought he was incredibly annoying and I wanted him to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was just looking it up here. Uh, Judge Reinhold was in the Beverly Hills Cop series. Um, he was in the Santa Claus movies. That's I think the he only was... reason I recognized him. And I haven't seen Santa Claus in ages, so I didn't remember why oh, no. I recognized him. Until I looked him up. Uh, he was also in the Beethoven series, uh, My Brother the Pig. <laughs> oh, I've got My Brother the Pig. That's got Scarlett Johansson in it. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he was also in Ruthless People, Pandemonium. Gr- oh, he's in Gremlins. Yeah. He's he's, um, he's a very specific type of actor. The one you see him, his performance in The Hollow is, is kind of reflective of the kind of character he plays more broadly. Uh, yeah, I could see that. But yeah, he was another thing that I thought was confusing about this movie because the 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 old guy Van Ripper, who I think is supposed to be descended from another character in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, the person Makes that sense. Ichabod was staying with at the time of his either death or disappearance, depending on how you want to interpret the end of the book. He he makes such a big deal about Ian being the the guy, the only guy who can save them. But I was like, I mean, his dad is a descendant too, and they don't bring that up until the end of the movie. <laughs> It's like, why are you going after the kid? Why not talk to the adult? <laughs> because uh, the target demographic for this movie, being that it's on ABC Family, is not 40-something-year-old men. It is uh, 14 to 20-year-old uh, women, ch- girls, whatever. 
<laughs> I mean, in fairness, I could totally see them going down like a an Ash versus Evil Dead route, where they sort of they try to recruit the kid, but he just isn't experienced enough. So they go for like the the guy in his mid forties who's just like, oh, fine, whatever, get, get rid of him. Okay, fine. well, with my back, no, not today. Fine, going to going to ibuprofen. Yeah, give him some ibuprofen and a. Uh, Four rounds. I'll go sort it. Don't worry. Oh Jesus! How's this going to affect? Am I going to turn up to work today? Oh, okay. okay right. We'll get this done quick. <laughs> Headless horseman. Uh, you can't be any scarier than senior management. Let's get this going. Come on. <laughs> See, that would have made this cool. Mm. I would have liked that movie more. <laughs> I'd watch that or a chimp version. Yeah. <laughs> the only other person that I recognized and i had to look them up to know why i recognized them the kid i think the first kid that dies in the movie he looked vaguely familiar and i assumed that he was probably in something i saw as a teenager joseph mazzello it turns out he was tim in jurassic park oh no way oh. <laughs> that's a good catch holy crap <laughs> i didn't catch it i had to look him up but you still recognize like you you he, you re- knew that you recognized and that in itself is pretty awesome Mm. I, yeah, I just, he was so much older that it, it must have just been just a vague something about his face. He was a lot less annoying, too. I mean, he deserved <laughs> to die in uh, Jurassic Park. He, I'm not sure he deserved to die in this. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the main message I kind of came across from this film as the credits rolled was it, it just, it felt like a film that was missing a bit of bite. It was just missing something to make it actually stand out against the noise that is low budget horror and halloween inspired cinema it just it, it kind of ended and i was like okay and um <laughs> it, I, it would have been nice if there was just a little bit more personality there a little bit more life behind the eyes a little bit more you know cuz for the time that it was made it basically hit every generic trope that it was possible to hit for that part of the decade yeah are you saying that it was too much 2004 for you it was it was way too 2004 for me. I'm a 2005 guy. <laughs> Insert your own Black Eyed Peas 2008, 2008 joke here. <laughs> Just going through my notes to see if there's anything I really wanted to talk about. Like I I wrote down like the main beats of the movie, but. It's, for the most part, I thought it was just kind of boring, and I don't really want to talk about the movie from beginning to end. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's the thing you could say is it's like kind of like cheap Halloween candy. It'll fill you up for like that minute, but then you're going to completely forget about it and be hungry again in 15 minutes. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I've got like stray notes. Like, I didn't like the fact that the, the a lot of the sort of cine choices were kind of handheld floaty cam. It was just like somebody kind of handheld holding the camera and just gently moving it left and right to kind of give the illusion that it's kind of a bit intense and unpredictable, but it, it wasn't used properly, so it just made it look like whoever was operating the camera had had a couple of Bacardis. <laughs> it's a very early, good early 2000s choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> if it was five years earlier, they would have been, been enjoying a delicious Zima, but... <laughs> <laughs> I think the main things that stood out to me of the movie were the beginning and the end, because for the most part, I think I pro- if somebody had looked in on me, I probably would have just had an incredulous look on my face because of how dumb this was. <laughs> <laughs> like the whole explanation of like how he could be a descendant, like his his main argument as to not being a descendant is he has a different last name. But I was like, before he did the whole convoluted explanation, I was like, well, it could have been somebody on your mom's side. Like, your last name doesn't necessarily have to be the same. But then they had this whole ridiculous convoluted explanation of how, how he was a crane, even though he was not a crane. I was mm-hmm. like, oh, whatever. This is so dumb. Yeah, it felt like a, it almost felt like a sequel. Like it should have been they should have had the original and then they should have had this. Mm. Not that oh, yeah. not that I'm saying there should have been a sequel, but just the way they were describing, especially at that part. It felt like it should have been a, well, you know, uh, you know, Ichabod Crane had a tryst with a lady, you know, the night before and she ended up getting pregnant and, you know, having the kid and, you know, that to kind of made more distance. sense, actually. Yeah. yeah. I actually, now that you're, now, not that it's the same thing, but you're talking about this being a sequel. I almost kind of wish that they had used the same cast and just made The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. It would have been cheesy, but I think I would have liked it better because you have... Like everyone in this movie, for the most part, 
is basically a character from the legend of sleepy hollow they just have different names because like brody is brom bones right and karen is katrina van tassel and obviously ian is ichabod but i feel like if you had just made the movie like even the, keep the modern accents i think it would have been a lot funnier <laughs> Not that it me, but i would have liked it i would have been more entertained if they had just done a straight up adaptation instead of like sort of but not exactly adapting it and making it sort of but not exactly a sequel like this is the descendant of the main character of the book but like i feel like it doesn't need to be that convoluted just because there was what was that movie the it was like a, a night a movie with knights like they had modern accents and there was like modern music and oh knight's tale uh heath ledger yeah yeah, yeah. Do something like that, except Legend of Sleepy Hollow. That would have been really entertaining. <laughs> oh, yeah, 100%. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, there's not a lot to say about this. I think it almost feels like, and obviously this happens a lot, like the Cloverfield movies past Cloverfield. They had, you know, pre-existing scripts, and they added the Cloverfield ending in there to kind of add something to it that gave it a little bit more, you know, oomph, mm-hmm. um, and name recognition and all that kind of stuff. That's what this felt like. It felt like it was a high school drama. And they're like, oh, God, we need something to make this stand out from all the other high school dramas we have. And we're looking, we've got a hole, you know, a, a hole in our movie schedule for Halloween. What can we do? Well, let's let's uh, add Sleepy Hollow to this or, or something. I just still can't get over the fact that the film's an hour and 17 minutes long and that the Headless Horseman turns up for approximately 30 seconds at the 12-minute mark and then doesn't turn up again until nearly 52 minutes into the film. That was <laughs> that was one thing. And I'm curious, I, John, I don't know that you've seen this movie, but have either of you seen Trick or Treat from 2007 or eight? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have not. The, the design, and obviously this came up before Trick or Treat, so you can't it's more just a, um, an observation but the horseman's head looks so much like sam's face like it, there's a lot of similarity between the two of them i thought oh, yeah i thought he looked yeah. like a misshapen version of the scarecrow from batman also true <laughs> mm. i should also talk about the end because the end just like i was internally face palming and rolling my eyes through the entire end it was so stupid <laughs> <laughs> Like, obviously, like at the end of the horseman, he's defeated way too quick. I thought it was a fake out and it sort of was, but not exactly because mm. he bursts into flames and he's dead. And that was the end of it. And I was like, what? Like they, they had like one clang of the sword fight, like one clang exchanged between Ian and the horseman. And then he bursts into flames. <laughs> like what? <laughs> the thing that it just reminded me of and it, it made me laugh when it happened was I, I couldn't get the image out of my head of the um, exploding bridge from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> just, just the second he touched the bridge, <laughs> gone. I literally just watched that for the first time last week. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what is your name, uh, Ichabod Crane? What is your quest? Defeat the horseman. What is the average wingspan of, a, of an unladen swallow? Is the answer three? Ooh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, the the end. It just it it felt like it just kept getting stupider and stupider because you had Ian kissing Karen, and then like Van Ripper, he was already a creepy old man, but then he became like super creepy because like Brody is watching them jealously. <laughs> And he comes up to him and says, don't worry, son, your reward will be far greater than the warm, supple embrace of tender woman flesh. And I'm just like gagging. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And there was a lot of that, too. It's like, okay, you know what? He's like, okay, we're good. We're going to go to prom first. Okay, cool. Great. Well, that's after he asks, are you two going to make babies in the most creepiest, dirty old man voice? Yes. I was supposed to be because like he clarifies afterwards that he's talking about them the descendants thing like he wants to make sure that they have her last name not his because he doesn't want to go through this again but he asked that in the most creepy disturbing way yeah yeah yep but then at the end after you get the whole convoluted thing like the last name thing they're all leaving and then you hear a growling noise and then he looks shocked and then that's the end so it's like he wasn't actually defeated well, you know, they they had they they had to at least pretend there was going to be a sequel, even though there never was going to be a sequel. 
would the sequel have been set in the far future? If they made a sequel now, that would be so funny. <laughs> that would be actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just to annoy Dan. And, and then they're going to be in like 2024 or 2025 fashion. And he's going to be like, why is it in 2025 fashion? <laughs> <laughs> you could uh, link it into my chimp idea and set it in the far future and make it one of the new Planet of the Apes movies. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like this idea. <laughs> yeah, you've had Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. You could have uh, the Planet of the Apes versus the Headless Horseman. And, and, and use this cast. I want to see Kaylee Cuoco as a chimp. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> well, how else are they gonna describe them having grown up? I mean <laughs> Damn you horsemen. Damn you all to <laughs> But yeah, other than that it was great. <laughs> other than literally everything about it. Sure. I mean the horse did a good job. <laughs> the credits were quite tidy. I really enjoyed the random argument about like recording um, Ian's pro, like his John Carpenter marathon. Mm. It's like you know you could go to the local video store and and get all of those. You know you can rent them. But it, it was two thousand and four. I think Netflix had a DVD delivery service at that point. That is so, true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> but the only reason they had that in there was to make the dad more hateable. And like, why did the dad need to be hateable? Because it was the early 2000s and parents are bad, man. I guess so. What happened to you, old man? You used to be cool. <laughs> oh, now I want to see a 70s version of this film. That would have been cool. <laughs> I like the fact that we've come up with like at least half a dozen better ideas across this, <laughs> across yeah. this episode that would have been better than what ended up happening. Because what ended up happening was just kind of like, okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> For the most part, except for when I was just incredulous at how stupid it was. <laughs> that, that's a fair point. Mm. It, it was like 80% boring, 20% incredibly stupid. 1% <laughs> hot gas. Half a percent funny. The, the, <laughs> the old lady saying how distasteful when she sees somebody get their head chopped off. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> like, I don't know who that lady was, but yeah, she, she was probably her and the horse were the best thing about this movie. I assume she must work in Congress because you see stuff like that every day. So, yeah, <laughs> I didn't write it down, but I think she was somebody famous at one time. I'm going to look her up. I was just doing that now. How do you spell hollow? I keep screwing that up. <laughs> H-O-L-L-O-W. Ah, I spelled it wrong. Dag nabbit. Okay, let's see here. Oh, Ale Eileen Brennan. Okay. And she was Joan Van Etten. So she was, no, she was Mrs. Peacock in Clue. She was uh, Tess Skeffington in Murder by Death. She's been in a lot of stuff. If you'd know, if you, if, if you had seen her, you would know her. Most of the stuff that I feel like I recognize the name of would have been something I probably saw when I was really young. So I don't remember. It's like, I think that I've seen Clue, but I think I was really young and maybe I only saw part of it. So I don't remember much of it. She's quite funny in Clue, highly suggested. And she's really good. I think you would have really appreciate uh, Clue and Murder by Death. They're both pretty cute. Something called Murder by Death is cute? <laughs> yes. Okay, it's it's dark but cute. It's sort of, they take, um, so it's done in the, I think the 80s? But they basically took all of the great detectives up to that point. So you'd get like Herc Hercule Perot, uh, Miss Marple, Sam Spade. There's a couple of others. Oh, Charlie Chan um, and a couple of others. And they all, they, they're under different names as not to infringe upon copyright, but they all get together to try and solve a mystery. Yeah, it, they're, they're, it's kind of like Clue a little bit, but it's not, it, they're both, they're both well worth a watch. They're, they're kind of, they're, they're super funny for the 80s. And okay. I think they hold up pretty well today. So it's, is you talk about Miss Marple, it's not based on like an Agatha Christie novel. No, it's not. It, it's kind of a, it's not like um, Airplane, but it's sort of in that realm. It kind of skews on all of those earlier detectives. Okay. But it has, so that there are dark moments, but it's it's like done in a kind of humorous, funny way. Mm -hmm. It's well put together. So well worth a watch. Like Clue is the better of the two, but Murder by Death is, especially if you're familiar with those characters, 
like being that you do a lot of that kind of stuff, I think you would appreciate some of the nuance that other people that aren't quite as much in the know don't like, I know there are things that are lost on me, but Uh, for some of those, like I know the characters, but those aren't ones that I'm super familiar with, but I have thought about doing like a series on Agatha Christie adaptations. There's a lot of them. (laughs) You'd be doing it. I know. I know. (laughs) Well, I mean, there's a lot of Alice in Wonderland and I keep doing those. So it could be something that's not, I don't do them all at once. Oh no, no, absolutely. (laughs) But that's one just even as a, as a watch. I think mm-hmm. you would appreciate it. Yeah. I'll like sit down and watch it with you because it's been a hot minute since I've seen it. That would be a fun one. Like, uh, well, Clue especially, but both I maybe would want to do. Yeah. Well, and Clue is its own kind of thing. But yeah, it's, 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 if you've ever seen like a play version of it, it kind of does that where it gives you multiple endings and, um, mm. so. Okay. I think on the uh, the new Blu-ray 4K of Clue, they, um, they've they introduced a feature that randomizes the ending. Again. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because originally there was, I think it was four or five endings they shot where each person was different and depending on which screening you went to, you'd get a different ending each yep. time. And they've, they've basically been able to transplant that to disc now, which is quite cool. That is neat. I'd heard that there were multiple endings, but I didn't know how that worked. So, like... You didn't know how it was going to end when you went to the theater, even if you had seen it before. Like exactly. you yeah. would randomly get a different ending. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That is an interesting idea for how to do a movie. I think it'd be interesting for a podcast episode, particularly because, like, you'd all sit down to discuss it, and you'd be like, "And I can't believe this guy was the killer. That guy? No, it was this one. This one? No." It was... <laughs> And Tim Curry is just, he's in it as um, one of the characters. And it's just, he is just so fun. Like, he is the, the he's kind of like the narrator of the thing. Like, he's kind of the, the thread that ties everything together. And his energy is just, it's amazing. It's such a, it's awesome. Well, I love Tim Curry. So I think I need to do this one. Like, again, even <laughs> if you just watch it, like as a, as a fun watch. Yeah. They actually, they did a um, Vinegar Syndrome have put out a documentary about the making of Clue oh, fairly recently. Yeah. Um, that apparently has got some really good reviews as well. So I should have picked that up. Oh, well. Well, those are your recommendations for the, uh, for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> the film was so good that, <laughs> that we diverted into a <laughs> 10 minute Clue <laughs> break off. <laughs> Sound of quality, rather. All right, so to to summarize, uh, eh, early two thousands, <laughs> the clothing is too too much of two thousand four. Uh, the horse and the little old lady were the best parts of it. Um, and it would have been better with chimps. Yes, <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna be honest, Gene. Know. I didn't care for it. The aesthetic <laughs> was completely wrong for the time. It just just didn't strike me as the kind of movie that had heart or feature. And I'm gonna give it two thumbs down. Oh. <laughs> I'll give it three thumbs down. Mm. I'm just going to give it an eh. <laughs> yeah, That's actually a perfect it's... review for it. Eh. Yeah. Eh. I came, I saw, I went eh. It wasn't as bad as Grinch the Musical, so. <laughs> I, that is actually very true. <laughs> I, would, I, I would actually definitely watch this rather than watch that again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we probably have said all that there is to be said about the hollow. <laughs> I mean, I have one more thing to say about the hollow, if I may. <clears throat> Give me a second here. <clears throat> I got to get my voice right. Okay, I'm good. I don't know what that was, but... <laughs> uh, that was me blowing a raspberry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> womp womp. <laughs> I wouldn't open my Count Chocula for this thing, I'm going to be honest. I mean, being how far your Count Chocula has to travel, I would hope you wouldn't open it for something like this. Oh no. (laughs) Maybe some of the Creeper cereal, absolutely, but uh, Chocula is staying firmly in the box. (laughs) That's the review right there. (laughs) (laughs) The review of this movie, the Chocula stays in the box. I repeat, in the box. <laughs> well, I think that's probably going to be all for the hollow. We will be back in the future for more. But until then, do you want to let people know where they can find you if they would like more from you, Dan? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you so much for having me on. Um, you can find me at TYTD Reviews. I'm on YouTube uploading weekly. I should be back up and running now. I think we came back on the 13th of September. So plenty of fun and frolics happening there. Um, I'm also on Twitter and Letterboxd at TYTD Reviews as well. So uh, head over there and uh, say hi. And thanks again. Yeah, uh, Nikki. Uh, as always, John, it's a pleasure. Um, I will try to keep my clothes equally in the early 2000s just to mess with Dan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what's coming out at this point. It's either going to be uh, ripped shorts of a variety with either fellow creators and or friends of the channel. Um, otherwise, it'll be uh, reviews uh, for the Halloween season. Um, just individual or sorry, solo reviews. Uh, so stop by and say hi. And yeah, that's about it. Okay, well, thanks for joining me, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening to every version ever. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe and follow my co-hosts as well. My link tree and all of our links will be in the description below. If you want more of my content, all my podcasts are available on YouTube as well as most podcast platforms. If you enjoyed this show, check out one of the other podcasts or check out my Patreon for bonus and extended episodes you won't find anywhere else. We'll be back soon with another brand new episode, so thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.